passion for what you're doing. This rings true because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard, and you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, and if you're not having fun doing it, you're gonna give up. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of John's Entitled Podcast, a partner of MoshPitNation.com. This week's guest is Matt Dice, formerly of All That Remains, currently of CKY. That's right, the big old fuck CKY, you. And with me, as always, is Daniel Terry. How are you doing? I couldn't be doing any better if I woke up with my head sewn to the carpet, John. <laughs> that, is a, that is a new one. Is that from Saw17? No, that is from... Uh, Passive that Aggressive is from... Dads, that's what Saw 17, the franchise, turns into. <laughs> no, that that's actually an old school one. Uh, that's uh, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Oh. You know, oh, cousin, yes, that's right. Cousin Eddie yes. asked Chevy Chase, how you doing? And he's like, Eddie, I couldn't be doing any, doing any better if I woke up with my head sewn to the carpet. That's right, I forgot about that. Which is about how I feel after the week I've had. Yeah, you have had quite the week, which is why this episode is uh, getting on a little bit later than, than normal. Uh, you were gone away, uh, like Cold, uh, and if you want to hear us talk about Cold and a lot of other active radio rock bands from the 2000s, go to our Patreon episode and uh, hear us talk all about it. I think our top ten lists, while slightly similar, uh, vary enough that we'll get you going back to your iTunes accounts or your Spotify's to go listen to those. You are going to love it, I promise. It's one of our longer episodes, too, and it's just us. Mm. Beautiful. Secret lovers for $2. How long did it, how long did it take you to edit that one, John? Uh, not, not at all, because <laughs> I didn't really oh, have just, to do... It's not just like raw. Had, yeah, I was like, we didn't really have intros, and we didn't really have uh, outros to do, so it's just the raw sound song, and we put a song in the front that we always do, and uh, a song that if you pay the $2 to hear it, uh, you will find out the song we end it with. That's beautiful, man. But, uh, yeah, man, yeah, I was uh, away. I was out of town. The first half of the week was just work stuff, which I'm sure nobody wants to hear about. Uh, the only thing that I will say on that is we did not have Wi-Fi in the two-star motel we were staying at. Uh, because whenever the boss sends you out of town, he sends you out of town very cheaply. So uh, we were in a two-star motel with no Internet access and really bad cell service. I couldn't even, like, text people. When I was on the job site, I could text people, but then, like, apparently that's not when you're supposed to text people is when you're working. Right. So, um, yeah, so that was an interesting weekend. And then after that, I packed my bag. I came home for about, uh, according to my wife, I came home for about five minutes. And then <laughs> I left and went to the Nashville Rock and Pod Expo. How was that this year, the second year, and your first actually attending as a podcast? Well, it was a much bigger venue. I could definitely say that. Uh, last year, it had kind of a flea market aesthetic, where we were in this big, long building that was filled with vinyl collectors. I mean, it was still really cool, but this year, it was more like an actual venue uh, with a bar. They put all the podcasts right by the bar, which is a really good idea. <laughs> uh, I mean, most of us drink during these interviews anyway. Absolutely. And uh, from the pictures that I posted, we actually brought our own beer as well. Because you can never be too careful. It wasn't, but, you know, it's just how we roll. All alcoholics, I guess. But, no, it was fun. Uh, we met a lot of cool people. We got to interview uh, Toby Wright, the famed record producer. Um, got to finally meet uh, Scott Bowling in person, which was cool. And uh, we also got to meet Joshua Toomey in person, who we've met before. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we also got to um, – we met the Roach Coach crew. And uh, believe it or not, John, Scott Bowling was very disappointed that you weren't there. I know. I had a baby shower to go to that day. I mean, I don't I, I don't know if he was about to cry or maybe if there was something in his eye or, or what, but he was, was genuinely disappointed that you weren't there, man. Well, if I would have met him, I would have been like, Scott Bowling, he's all strikes, no spares. Perfection. You know what's funny? Before, before I actually watched the show, I really thought it was legit because I'd seen ads for it. I thought it was legit a show about bowling, and I was like, <laughs> "Well, um, I can see that we'll good see. company, good company with bowling." Like thinking, like, "Yeah, you're having good company while you're bowling." He should he should take the interviewees bowling. I think that would be really cool. I get that it's a name thing, and I wouldn't change it. But I mean, that's that that's lost revenue right there, man. Lost uh, revenue. Yeah, 
I mean, I enjoyed the uh, Nerdist. Uh, I don't know if that's a dirty word now, but I enjoyed the Nerdist uh, bowling game interview things that they used to do. Oh yeah, the yeah, celebrity bowling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Scott Bowling. But, uh, there's there's your new idea. All we ask is that uh, you invite us on sometime and uh, you pay for the game. I'll pay for absolutely. the shoes. Oh, cool! I don't have to pay for anything. I'm loving this deal, man. Uh, I mean, I'm paying for the gas. You're paying for the alcohol. Well, well. I, that's implied. I mean, I would I would buy that anyway, so I don't really consider it if it's part of my normal budget to be me paying for it. <laughs> so we got that going for us. But anyway, yeah, man, it was cool. Um, it was very uh, classic rock centered, uh, which is what it was like last year. So we had a lot of Kiss podcasts, a lot of classic rock. Um, my co-host on my other podcast, Joe, was actually on a Bruce Springsteen uh, based podcast. It's so funny. I I went to buy some. Please vinyl. tell me it's called on the or on the run or board to run. No, I'm trying to remember what it, I think it's called. Tramps like us. Uh -huh. And uh, anyway, yeah, they, it's funny. He was because they were set up right next to us, and I went to look at the vinyl, and I came back like three and a half hours later, and uh, Joe had already been in a podcast, had been on a podcast while I was gone, <laughs> which is and really weird because like, he's the one that doesn't talk the most typically. Yeah, well, and I think it's good for him, man, to get out there and stretch his legs. But, uh, yeah, it was very classic rock-centered. You know, I think with the exception of maybe, like, us and uh, Toomey and uh, Roach Coach, I think I think we were kind of the only ones representing stuff that had come out after 2000, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, so there was a little bit of a, of a disconnect there, I think. But, uh, man, you know, the people that were there for uh, for the theme to see the panels and stuff – had a lot of really cool stuff going on up on the main stage with like celebrity panels and stuff like that, and uh, so the people that the people that paid for admission got exactly what they what they asked for. You know, a lot of vinyl vendors there. Um, it, it was it was a it was a barrel of fun. A barrel of fun. That's the unit yes. of measure now. It is. It is. It is the only me the only unit of measure. Well, you know, another great unit of measure is how you rock. And I think uh, no band has really been more consistent in that. And, and also kind of speaking to, you know, it's not classic rock per se, but I definitely think they're AR, they are a classic rock band for us is CKY. Um, I mean, it kind of sucks. You know, Volume 1 came out. I remember Volume 1 coming out and obviously 96 Quiet Bitter Beings being all over MTV and stuff. And then, you know, Tony Hawk video games and didn't help that, uh, that, uh, that Jackass show featured them as well. Yes, that show. <laughs> and and that the brother is none other than Bam Margera. So, but I think anybody who's actually a fan of the band, uh, they are a very interesting band in and un, unto themselves in the fact that, you know, I think a friend of mine put it the best. Take, like, death metal, like, te technical riffs and stuff, but slow them at, like, halftime. So, like, you can really hear everything, and it has more of a groove than it is about, you know, speed and, and finesse and kind of put poppier arrangements around them and, and that's kind of what you get with cky yeah i mean they're definitely uh solid as as you could get and i think it's i don't think that's a that's too far off of a description that they took kind of like more extreme music and kind of i don't want to say watered it down because i don't get that watered down implies like a negative right. you know connotation made pal palatable but made it palatable for the masses yeah you know because not ever not Nobody besides me and my friends want to hear, you know, 10,000 miles an hour, you know, every single second. So, you know, you you add some courses in there. You add some cool stuff. So, yeah, I think I think in a lot of ways they are the arena rock, classic rock of our generation. Yeah, and unfortunately I think a, a lot of infighting has caused uh, maybe a, a disintegration of uh, where the band should be if they would have been able to kind of stick together and – and do all that stuff, but I mean, when the band went away, I wasn't surprised. Just like I said, due to all the infighting. But uh, a couple, of, uh, it's been about a year now. Uh, they announced, you know, they're getting back together. They put out this record, The Phoenix, via Roadrunner Records. Came back as a trio again, but except for instead of having Darren Miller, they now have Chad Ginsberg on guitar and voice, right. and right. Jess and uh, Matt Dice uh, rounding out the band. And, you know, have there's some guests. Uh, they had Brent Hines come out, and they recorded it at the legendary uh, Desert Studios out there, uh, where, like, Queens of Stone Age have done records and a slew of other great bands. And, I mean, we didn't necessarily really kind of get into that. I, I had a brief 
you know, 30 minutes with, with Matt. But I think we kind of cover quite a bit of different stuff in it. And uh, it's it, like I said, it's been a chat I've been looking forward to doing for a while. Matt was actually supposed to be one of the first handful of guests I had on. And then obviously once the CKY machine started rolling, uh, it, it, it just took this long for there to be some time to get it done. Oh, yeah. I mean... I think it's great that they that they came back because, like, and to be honest with you, I didn't really even know that there was a whole lot going on with CKY until you were like, "Hey, dude, CKY, they're a thing," you know, because <laughs> you know it, bands come and go, especially especially when they're on that level, right. you know. Yeah. And uh, I just kind of figured out, ah, well, they're done. It's not going to be the same as it was before. Why should I care? Um, and then I get to listen to the I get to listen to your interview, and I'm like, oh, okay, I'm I, I could get on board for this. Yeah, and speaking of getting on board, let's get on board with my chat with Matt Dice of CKY. Go see Slayer as soon as I'm done with this. Oh shit! And and by see Slayer, I mean literally see one song and then leave. <laughs> <laughs> Is that all you want? Yeah, I mean, I'm just kind of really going to see Anthrax and and uh, Lamb of God, really. Yeah, yeah. You just you got to do it for the clout. Just just say, uh, oh yeah, I saw saw a song. Well, I mean, I did that on Ozfest a handful of years ago when a friend of mine was tour managing a band and. I stuck around for like two songs of Ozzy, and I was like, eh, saw it. <laughs> exactly. So you guys are in Fargo, North Dakota, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, it's actually the first time I've ever been in North Dakota. Do they, do they so, have the accents like the movie, or no? They do. Um, they uh, they say bag, like bag, and like, I don't know, it's it's pretty crazy. I thought I thought it would be like just some desolate winter hellscape, but it's actually a beautiful day, and the downtown is really nice, and everyone seems very cool. So uh, it, I'm actually having a great time. That's interesting. I definitely wouldn't have thought that either. No. Well, I'll kind of get right into it because I, I think I only have you for like a half hour. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, like we can go over too. I'm I'm fine. Okay. Like we have a VIP thing at six our time, so like yeah, I I basically have an hour if need be. Okay, yeah, I uh, yeah, I was told to kind of keep it closer to the, to the half hour point, but yeah, I'll see where I'm at when I get to oh, right, my right, questions. Right. Okay, so I have the pleasure this uh, early evening of talking with Matt Dice, bass player, synth player, and all around good guy for CKY. How are you doing this afternoon, this evening? Oh, I'm I'm not bad. I guess two out of three ain't bad there. But how are you doing? <laughs> doing good. Get to uh, get to see the the end of an era for for Slayer and for I guess metal as a whole. It's been very weird. I've been in this yeah. Uh, I've been in this very weird mindset the last little bit, uh, probably a week or so, just really thinking about the finality of a lot of bands uh, that are important to me and are important to the musical scene. I mean. One of my favorite bands, uh, him, are no longer around anymore for for now, uh, and you guys got to play on that. Uh, Warp tour just ended yeah. yesterday, I believe was the last day, and uh, Slayer's mm-hmm. calling it a day. Like, I mean, it's just all these all these things that have been around and been such a, a prevalent part of the music scene are just kind of slowly fading away. Yeah, it's it's definitely sad to see it, but it, it there's a bit of it that pisses me off in a way. Because you, it's almost like in America, you have to do something so drastic, like announce your final tour, announce that it's the end of something, to finally get people to show up to your shows. Um, it, it, the culture of going to gigs has been long dead before you know these giants have even retired. So it's something where, yeah, it, it sucks to see Warp Tour go, but I hope people realize Warp Tour is just a collection of bands that maybe on their own do eight to two thousand people a night, if if they do it, you know, a headlining gig at a club. So right. you really need to start going out to more shows. You got to support it because, you know, it, it's not a surprise those things weren't sustainable. So it's uh, it's sad to see the culture going 
going to gigs has uh, been on the decline for a long time here. Kind of speaking to the sustainability of, of, you know, supporting bands and so forth, you know, I kind of wanted to get into a little bit of, of your time in, in All That Remains. You know, a, a fact that mm-hmm. I, I don't know that a lot of people that are fans of your of CKY are aware of or not, but it seemed like you kind of got out a kind of before the shift in sound of that band particularly, but just kind of before metalcore itself kind of just, you know, imploded on itself from just kind of being an oversaturated genre. Mm-hmm. It's true. I, um, I, I, the last tour I did with All That Remains, we were in a Dodge 3500 van, single axle trailer, a tour manager who would do sound and guitar tech and be a roadie. And we were getting paid in pizzas pretty much and would come home after a month and a half of being on the road and have no money to show for it. Um, that is certainly not the case with them now. Uh, right. They've, they've found, found a way to be very, very commercially successful. And, uh, you know, they're great guys and they couldn't happen to better people. But, yeah, there, there was a big shift because back then it was almost like we were playing that music just to piss off everybody and you know like whatever was trendy and cool at the time we did not fit into it we were kind of standing as like a little bit of a little bit of rebellion against it um but then you know you see what alive and alive are just breathing and end of heartache by kill switch and uh uh you know some of the early shadows fall stuff there it it shined such a big light on all those massachusetts bands they blew up all at the same time um and and yeah, I think it killed new metal. It killed like any of those last new metal bands that were hanging on. Right. Uh, you know, made made alternative rock go a lot more metallic, which was cool. But uh, yeah, it, it it created a lot of uh, bands that just ended up sounding the same for about you know the next ten years after that. Was you know because. <sighs> Having some people that we have mutual friends and so forth, you know, I kind of always wondered, was that really a style that you were a fan of? Or is it one of those things where after kind of slagging it out for so long, you're just kind of like and hearing the same kind of music night in and night out for, you know, a couple of tours where you're just like, man, I really would like to play something completely different than this or just completely walk away just because it's it's not as maybe as fun as it used to be. Yeah, I I was never. Uh, I, I mean, I hate to say it, but like, yeah, I, I'm not a I'm not a big fan of uh, like metalcore in in general or like the heavy stuff. And I wasn't cool enough to like fit in in the hardcore circles. And I wasn't I didn't have long hair enough to fit in with the metal guys. But I was too fat to fit in with the emo kids. Like <laughs> I, 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 you know, <laughs> I just I, I I kind of was doing my own thing. I knew I could play bass pretty well and. I knew I wanted to play music, but there was no, no real spot. So at the time I saw an opening and I took it with all that remains and uh, it, it was able to at least establish who I was as a musician and get my name out there a bit. Um, but you know, it's not like I was going home and religiously listening to at the gates and, and, you know, all the early metalcore shit. Right. So how exactly did you end up, joining CKY. I mean, they've had a handful of players in the whole thing with Vern and stuff like that, you know, mm-hmm. has been well, literally well documented, but I don't think I've ever really heard or seen like exactly how they found you. Well, so what, with all that remains in the tours we did, I would have to drive a lot cause I wasn't, um, wasn't drinking age yet. So okay. I, I, you know, I was usually the, the sober one after shows. So I was doing a lot of the drive. And so, by doing that, I get free range of the uh, the stereo, and I had a friend make me a mix of uh, I don't know a couple of bands that he liked, and on it were uh, I think like five tracks from Infiltrate, Destroy, Rebuild, and I, at this point I really didn't know anything about CKY other than the Bam Margera connection, but like I never jumped into the music or anything like that. So on tour I was listening to it a lot, and I'm like, man, this band is. Uh, kind of got it all that i like the playing is technical like the guitar work is technical the songs are catchy and hooky and with no screaming all over the fucking thing (laughs) so i i i I said you know what when i get home i'm gonna i'm gonna look them up see if they're on tour uh you know kind of get to learn a little bit more about them and i got home i went on the computer and i went to their website and i saw that 
there was some article that said like search for bass player continues uh and i was like holy shit is this a sign i you know see what i can do here i scoured their website i couldn't find a contact link or anything but i saw a webmaster link at the very bottom and i shot an email saying like hey total shot in the dark here i don't know if like you just make this site or if you're affiliated with the band but i play in a band called other remains i would love to uh learn more if, if you're still looking for a bass player just total shot in the dark sent the email and completely forgot about it and then then the next day i got a response saying oh i've heard of see or i've heard of all the remains if you could play that you know you definitely do this or what are you doing next week and i had some back and forth correspondence with the singer and I, I I guess I didn't even take it seriously at the time. And I was like, Oh, you know, nothing next week. That couldn't have been farther from the truth though. <laughs> All that remains was getting ready to go on the sounds of the underground tour, which was the yeah. tour that ended up breaking. Yeah. So <laughs> I think there was maybe a month before that tour happened. And I just out of nowhere agreed to fly to Los Angeles to what I thought was just audition. It ended up not even really an audition. It was like, here's 30 songs. Can you learn them? And I did. I, I spent the time out in L.A. learning it. And then I, I flew back home to Massachusetts. And I, I sat and I learned pretty much every song out of their catalog by year. And then next thing I know, it was like, well, cool. Well, the tour starts in uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, are you going to, is there going to be a conflict with all that remains? And I was like, oh holy shit. So I guess I have the gig. Like there was never a, Oh, you're hired. It was just like, no, you're the guy. It all happened really quick. And it it was my first real experience with like having to, you know, do my own thing at maybe the expense of someone else. And it, it made me feel bad, but I had to, I had to quit all that remains like and leave them high and dry right before this huge tour that they went on. And, uh, yeah, you know, it, it broke my heart to do that. And they, they had some ill will towards me for, for a little while, understandably. Um, but yeah, within a month's time, I was driving the van, getting paid in pizza, and then on a tour bus with CKY doing a, a full sold out North American headliner. And it was, it was just such a huge experience for me. And I, I, I think what was I, maybe 20 or 21 years old when this happened. So it was, uh, it was a lot to get thrown in my lap at once, but it, it was a pretty incredible, surreal experience. So uh, around that time is around the time I would have seen the band for the first time uh, when, and maybe my mm -hmm. timeline is slightly wrong. I mean, it's been a long, <laughs> long time, but uh, yeah. Because technically, when you came on, if, from what I remember officially, you an answer had, an answer can be found had just come out you didn't play on the mm -hmm. record but you were credited as being a member of the band is my timeline on that correct yeah yeah i had um i'd missed out on all the tracking and uh, i guess <laughs> missed out on even knowing who they were as people when that was when that album answer can be found came out so i was basically coming on as the live bassist for the touring for that album cycle okay so, so yeah two, 2005 Okay, so that's when I saw the band for the first time on the Fireball Ministry tour that you guys were doing. And oh yeah, it was kind of interesting because I remember there being and I don't know if this is like this anywhere else in the, you know, on that tour that you did, but I you know, I got a lot of I heard a handful of people kind of being like, you know, fuck fuck the new bass player, we want Vern back and it's like <laughs> it's it's just kind of yeah. weird because it's like, well, he's gone kind of for a reason. Uh yeah. but still it was just kind of interesting to to see you know, I knew the fan base is obviously very rabid, but it was very interesting to see how mm -hmm. loyal people were to to a specific member, even though he wasn't even the original bass player either. Um, oh yeah. But I was gonna say all that aside, yeah. though. You know, you kind of yeah. joined at a very seemingly dysfunctional time for the band. You know, IDR came out, did, did very good, and then this record came out, and it seemed like it kind of fell on deaf ears, and then the inward fighting and it wasn't i don't well no you guys put out carver city a couple years later but it it was one of yeah. those things that just seemed like the there was just a lot of turmoil in the band so it's like you know you're saying like i went from a you know going to i was in a band that was in a van playing for pizzas basically to being in a, a sold yeah. out tour going across the u.s but now i'm in a potentially more dysfunctional environment than i ever had been and i'm trying not to put words oh, in your yeah. mouth either though 
Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, like I, I never want to speak ill of anyone who can't defend themselves or anything if they're not around, but um, it, it, you know, it, it was, it was definitely a dysfunctional time with the band. Um, and, you know, everyone had their problems. Everyone had their uh, demons and egos and stuff like that. And I, <laughs> being you know dopey little kids from new england uh, not ever knowing any of these things it, it was it was weird for me yeah like i would go to shows and hear people being like oh man you know fuck you i miss burn and like then like the drama in the band and stuff like that it was uh it was weird for a 21 year old at that point to like handle especially with no experience at that level yet what was a you know kind of looking back and just kind of going through a lot of the things that the band went through what's something that you look back now and and maybe realize that it was like you know a blessing in disguise or maybe like something that you were able to take away and learn from it uh and apply it to other things outside of even the band well just just knowing how fickle and temporary anything is like whether it be fame or relevance or uh, the music industry itself. I mean, Answer Can Be Found, I think, was one of the last uh, things I was ever involved in that had a full music industry behind it. You know, like it was before right. streaming went in and killed everything. So just knowing how temporary it all is and how, you know, instead of, instead of just drinking my way across the country and playing shows and being a general shithead, like, realize this is uh it could all go away in a second just be grateful you even got your foot in the door in the first place so now like <laughs> there was the br breakup and me quitting and stuff like that in 2011 and i i you know what maybe five years of not playing music professionally and i applied that to my life i, I was just like you know be a good person and be grateful for what you have and then once the band got back together i i, I swore i'm not going to waste a single day with this and, you know i I wake up early. I, I walk through the cities we tour. I take as many pictures as I can. I, I meet every single fan I can. It's um, definitely taught me to be a lot more grateful. It's interesting you kind of say that because when we were talking about doing this podcast like over a year ago, something I kind of mm -hmm. wanted to touch on a little bit was, was your job. And if I'm not mistaken, you work for Ticketmaster, which I thought was kind of interesting that it's like you went from being a performer <laughs> to then kind of working for a completely different side of the music industry and a side that, you know, typically oh, yeah. people who go to concerts always have pretty negative things to say about Ticketmaster and how they kind of fuck people over. But all that aside, mm -hmm. you know, did was what was that like, you know, kind of working in a completely different realm within the music industry, even if it's just kind of a customer service type job? Oh, yeah. Well, the, the role I had, it was a, uh, like, social media analytics and service role for a secondary ticketing company like uh uh StubHub okay. was was the uh the company there so my job was basically to read any mention of tickets or concerts or anything like that over social media i got to learn a lot about like rabid fan bases for sure like um we would deal with all the on sales for like one direction and five seconds of summer and taylor swift and uh demi lovato and really just see how much of a fucking like megalith those fan bases are and how much reach and engagement they have online to promote a tour. Um, so it, it was definitely weird. And, you know, like I had my reservations with the secondary ticketing industry in general. I thought they were just the scum of the earth, but you know, I needed a job at the time. So <laughs> I ended up uh, just getting involved with them. You got to eat, you know? Right. But it was interesting. You know, I got to I got to learn a lot about the power of social media with young fan bases and the thoughts and opinions of the ticketing world in general, which is uh, usually overwhelmingly negative because um, a lot of people think they're responsible for ruining the experience of going to concerts. Yeah, I, I definitely wasn't sure, you know. If, if anything you learned from working at that job, you were able to take and apply to the band once, you know, you guys had come back, you know, to being a band, you know, working, like maybe mm -hmm. having a working relationship with it, like a stub hub or, you know, being able to use some of the, the things that you learned from, from looking at social media from that perspective. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, Cause I, I was responsible for a lot of the uh, um, promotions and giveaways and stuff like that for, for StubHub. Uh, whenever an on sale would happen, we would try to tag our name along with it to, to increase our metrics. So yeah, with CKY, I'm, I'm pretty much one of the key social media guys here. Like we don't, we don't really have an outside team. It's just uh, a fan of ours named Damien and I that, that do a bulk of it. So yeah, I try to take whatever I learned from there in terms of uh, how to properly get the most reach, most engagement out of a tweet. I'm, I, you know, I'm still learning every day. So, you know, we talked a little bit ago about, you know, you were saying that it seems that sometimes bands thrive on the fact of having to, you know, announce a farewell tour to get people to come out and so forth. Adversely, you know, getting to go to the Warp Tour last year that you guys were on, you know, we went to the, mm -hmm. my wife and I sporadically went to the, uh, the Hartford date and, mm -hmm. You know, I've made many mentions about, you know, me paying attention to the, the behind the scenes stuff on the tour. But something that was interesting to me, because you guys played later and kind of later in the day, was being, you know, yeah. watching you guys play from behind you and seeing all of kids who were probably, if I had to put a number on it, maybe 15, 20 years past when, you know, the, the prime of the band really was around but still seeing the, the oh, yeah. same fervor of, you know, the CKY chants and, you know, everyone knowing the songs. And I was just pleasantly surprised that it's like, holy shit, this band is probably seemingly as popular now, maybe as they were before they left. Like, do you think yeah. that you guys leaving and taking the hiatus for a while, like made kind of the heart grow fonder for, to see you guys again? I think it, it helped them definitely hurt it. Uh, Cause from, like uh the like five six years that we were in acting there were whole genres of music like post hardcore and like um you know like heavier emo and stuff like that like bands that can't were just like local bands to us right before we quit are now like selling out three thousand theaters and we have no clue who any of the bands in the scene are so we don't know <laughs> who to be friends with like is this a famous band i i don't know like we were we, we were so clueless with the current culture of music but at the same time all the fans missed us and all their younger brothers who were like brothers and sisters that were 12 13 and too young to go to concerts are now prime concert going age so you, you you've got like siblings coming out to shows it, it it's been weird like um it's we see the old faces but we see some people and when i see them i'm like you were like four when i joined the band what what is how how did you ever find out about us but i don't know it, it boggles my mind anyone who comes out I'm, I'm thankful for no matter what what the age is you know this is the first uh headlining tour you've gotten to do on the phoenix album cycle how is it yeah you know being able to finally kind of probably dip into the, the album and give some of the you know give it three or four tracks you know in a live debut like how has that been for mm. you it, good the translate very well live um, just because we we wrote them from the standpoint of make it sound good when we as a band play in the room uh, instead of like hey let's just pro tools the fuck out of this and uh, <laughs> write it before ever testing it live so right. the songs do work really well live um, we did we did a headlining tour in the UK and Europe uh, that was that was our first tour back uh, was doing a headliner in the UK but this is a, the first proper one in the U.S., so it's been uh, it's it's been great so far, and the tour package is good too. Yeah, I, it's a pretty diverse package. I mean, all all, all things considered, mm -hmm. and uh, I definitely the other yeah. thing that I took away from from listening to the songs because you know I never saw the the iteration with Daniel Davies in it, but I mean Tyler and I used to talk about how that was probably one of the more stronger representations in a live setting of the band than had been in mm -hmm. existence for a while. And so to see you guys yeah. play technically as a three piece, even though uh, at least on the warp tour, uh shitbird was kind of doing the ancillary like synths and so forth. Uh, I don't know if he yeah, still we is. Just, yeah. No, uh, we, we've since uh, switched over to uh, uh, like a, a live backing tracks. Like we, we went and tracked all the synths ourselves and okay. timed it up. Um, so that you know it's just perfect there at shippers did his best but you know he's, we needed a keyboard player so we got the best drummer we knew 
<laughs> well, that was the thing. Is like I remember looking, and my wife walked wandered over to that side of the stage after a little bit, and then I go, I go, is that dude next to you, off to your right? Is he really playing the keys? And she goes, Yeah, why? And I go, Because he's a drummer. <laughs> and then she goes, Oh. <laughs> And I was like, I yeah, I didn't know he played keys, but okay, like, well, that's fine. I just didn't know if he legitimately was yeah. playing keys or if it was just kind of like a, a fun rib, like, all right, we're going to have, you know, Shitbird, quote unquote, playing the keys on this. And I was like, I, you know, learn something new every day, I guess, but made me wonder. <laughs> no, he, he did it. We, we sat down with him for about two months straight. We made YouTube video after YouTube video, tutorial after tutorial. <laughs> he, uh, he, he, we basically gave him a primer on how to play piano. It was, uh, um, he, he was able to accomplish a lot in the short amount of time he had, but ultimately it, it wasn't for him, but he was the life of the party at Warped Tour. It was probably one of the best summers ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was your, you know, now that Warp's done, you know, I was just reading an article on bands reflecting on, you know, Warp Tour as a whole. What was, you know, your favorite memory either being on the Warp Tour or maybe attending one? Um... I, I don't know. As far as best memory, each day bleeds into itself because it, it's so similar. You wake up in a parking lot, you start setting up your camping gear basically up behind your trailer. Right. And, uh, you know, you, you wait for catering to happen and then you hope a porta potty isn't overflowing with shit by the time you need to use it. <laughs> um, but just the camaraderie after the show is when it, you know, the sun's gone down, the last stage is, is wrapped up and, you know, say it's, 10 p.m. and your bus call is until three in the morning you get to hang out with all your peers and like bands you admire and bands that you discovered and and learn that really no one's all that different we're all out here fighting over the same shallow money pit we're all doing our best we're all missing our families um it, it, it was great i made a lot of good friends so that the friendships were definitely the best part you know Another thing, and I feel like this is kind of low-hanging fruit, but I mean, as a as a fan of the band and a fan of, you know, just music in general, I, I often wonder these things because now I'm at this age where this shit is happening and it kind of freaks me out. But, you know, yeah, Carver City turns ten years next year. Are you yeah. guys? Have you have? Has there been any entertainment of maybe doing like a, a one-off show or something where you kind of play it in its entirety? I mean. I remember when it came out, it took it took me a little bit to get into the record as a whole, but I think it's because it honestly was a full album, not just here's a couple of singles and then here's some you know kind of filler around it, but it was a full on album. Yeah. And so I feel like yeah. maybe now, ten years later, people can kind of appreciate the record for what you were trying to do then that they just weren't ready for. So I don't know if maybe yeah. there has been any interest in revisiting that record and kind of giving it a, a, a live you know playthrough or if you know nostalgia tours there, like that are I'm, not really in what you guys are into we're, we're really trying to avoid any sort of nostalgia as is just you know like it, it's hard enough where you know you, you get a, a small handful of people at the shows that expect we man to be there and like <laughs> uh, you know they, they're just here to sing that song from tony hawk and uh you know, so we we try to avoid any sort of nostalgia stuff as we can. But Carver City at the time, when when we played those songs initially ten years ago, they went over pretty piss poor live. Like the, it was definitely not an album written for live performance. It was just kind of uh, created uh, in the studio. So it, it's left a bad taste in our mouth. We don't hardly ever, if at all, play songs from it. But I guess anything's possible. We're we're always going to try to revisit all the material we have because, you know, with the headlining sets, you gotta you gotta fill fill the time. But we we find you know like the infiltrates of volume one, uh, and then of course songs from the Phoenix seem to go over best for live performance. And then uh, kind of in in wrapping up, you know, you guys, uh, you know, like I was saying, you you did Warp Tour last year. You you did a European run. You're doing a, a U.S. run right now, and then another European run. Is there still some momentum left uh, in the touring behind the the Phoenix uh, that will carry you into next year, or will we start seeing the band kind oh, of wind down to start working on whatever is next? Well, we have we have something in the works, some new music that should be scheduled to hit. Uh, I, I believe Black Friday. Don't 
quote me on that exactly, but um, uh, some new music is going to hit, uh, which at that point we're going to uh, make another push and, and have some more tours coming out. But we will be announcing another tour very shortly um, for some dates that are they're coming up quick, hitting a lot of the cities we haven't done on this run and uh, going out with, with a band that I'm very excited to, I, I just can't say who yet, but um, <laughs> yeah. So we'll, we'll be, we'll be announcing a, a, another tour pretty soon. We have uh, more music scheduled to come out in November. Um, we, we don't want to slow down at all. So we're going to, we're going to try to hold on. Hold on. Sorry. I had to, you know how iPhone does scam oh, yeah. likely. Yeah. <laughs> had one of those numbers just call me. Um, so yeah, we, we have no, no uh, desire to slow down or take a break in any way. We've got more music to come, more tours to come. And uh, frankly, we just don't want to do anything else. We, we love where we are. We love the fact that, that we are so busy is it's a blessing because even, you know, 10, 12 years ago, whatever, we, we had never played this many shows in a year. Right. So that we're, we're the busiest we ever have been. We don't want to slow down. And then uh, lastly, where can everyone find you and or the band online? Well, I have since deleted my Instagram. Uh, I thought I noticed that. You can see the, yeah, the, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so CKY Music, at CKY Music on Instagram and Twitter. And I'm still on Twitter at, at Matt Dice, uh, Dice spelled D-E-I-S. And then uh, I always like to end these episodes out with a song. So what would you like me to play it out to? And maybe a little backstory as to why. It doesn't necessarily have to be a CKY song if you don't want it to be. Hmm. How about, how about this song, Focus Shall Not Fail by All That Remains? That's one I'm really proud of from the This, this Dark and Hard album. Okay. Well, Matt, uh, thanks again for taking the time. And if you are listening to this, uh, CKY is still out with Slaves and Royal Thunder until September 2nd, and then basically they will be hitting mm-hmm. the overseas market from November 30th until December 14th, and as you heard, lots of touring to follow into the new year. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully Thank one you very will come much, to uh, Grand Rapids. I know you guys haven't been here in fucking forever. Yeah. It's one of my favorite towns to come to as well, so I'm, I, I, I hope this next run comes there because I, I do love it and I need some of that good beer. Ha. Well, if you guys come, I'll uh, try to bring you some, and uh, maybe we can do an in-person chat as well then. Hell yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you again for your time, and enjoy the show tonight. Dude, thank you so much. Good to talk to you. Yeah, you as well. So that was my chat with Matt Dice, bass player for CKY. Dan, what'd you think of that? That was only a half hour. That's crazy. Like, yeah. they, I mean, it was just, you, I mean... I don't know. I don't know if you're just becoming a better interviewer or <laughs> like the amount of content in there because it definitely felt like a 45 minute. Yeah. But uh, but definitely um, chock full of a lot of interesting stuff. Well, I think the thing too is like you know I had for a while I wanted to kind of do be known for like the long form interviews and, and unfortunately as you start getting kind of a name for yourself and you get in on these press circuits and so forth. Uh, you just kind of tend to find that that's just not really possible. Uh, people have a finite amount of time. They're usually doing other press, other media. So you can't, you don't get a full hour or two or three uh, in some instances. Um, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> but it's definitely one of those things where I think uh, I think I've gotten better at you know having a time limit. And I think it just comes with the repetition of like, okay, you get like 15, 20 minutes with somebody and it's like, or 30 minutes and you're like, all right, how do I incorporate a lot of information in a short amount of time? And you, you pray and hope that the person actually is talkative. So like the kind of helps as opposed to like, you can ask quick questions, but they give you a lot of, of depth in the answer. And I mean, Matt did a really good job with that. Like he's not really the one known to do a lot of interviews. Typically it's Jess and Chad and you know, I have a mutual friend, and a few mutual friends of uh, Matt's and have known Matt for a little while via social media over the last handful of years. But it was kind of nice, you know, like something that we had talked about a long time ago was like he was like, yeah, I'm not really big into metal. And it's like you came from arguably one of at the time, one of the bigger metal metalcore bands at the peak of that sound, especially like, you know, with this darkened heart. And it's like and you're telling me like, yeah, I left it because I didn't like that stuff. I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. 
doesn't that just blow your mind? Because like I hear that a lot too from you know guys that are in metal bands that are just like, I'm just not into it as much. It's one of those like you start playing in a band because everybody wants to play in a band, right? You know, and then you know once you once you reach a certain level of success within that band, you're kind of like, okay, well, now that I'm a musician that people know, like, does this really what I want to be known for? You know? Yeah, I. I definitely had never heard it specifically how he got into CKY. It just seemed like one of those things, like they fired Vern. And then the next thing you know, it's like he got the job. And it was kind of interesting to find out that that really is more, <laughs> more or less what happened. Is like he was like, well, I mean, I was going to go do Stones of the Underground, which, I mean, just think about that. Just think about like that. When he told me that, I was like, man, what a mind fuck. Like you're getting ready to go on probably outside of Auspice, one of the most – the biggest things for the metalcore scene of the early 2000s for any band that was on it, it did so much for Eats It and Kill Switch Engage and, and On Earth and Guar and like all these bands. And it's like, well, basically the, the one, the one tour that did so much for all that remains. And that was the one he didn't go on yet. Then he turns around and goes on the CKY tour where basically it was just sort of the beginning of the end uh over the next couple of years so it's it's kind of interesting it's like that damned if you do damned if you don't like okay like you didn't want to be in a van anymore and you weren't really pleased with the sound however like you're making more money but there's a p- <laughs> other problems right yeah i think it's uh i i, th- I... <laughs> mm-hmm. I i think being a nice guy goes a long way uh apparently yeah. and uh you know, it's definitely one of those, like, I think sometimes when things have to fit, you know, they just they just have to work. I mean, I think there are certain bands out there. I don't know if you believe in destiny or not, uh, John, but I think there are certain things that are just naturally meant to be that way. You know, and I think I think in this case, it's just one of those, you know, hey, man, sorry, my future is not with all that remains. And to be able to hold out, to be able to make that call, because how many how many people quit a, a, an arguably successful band and then just. You never hear from him again. Like that's it. Uh, Ron so, McGovney. For, well, yeah, but besides. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well. Well, I just heard I, him on a podcast. That's the only reason his name is like fresh in my mind. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess what I was, I was trying to trying to say is that some people just have a certain amount of intuition to them, right. and I think it's a mixture of intuition and drive. Yeah. Where you're able to just kind of. Um, you know something better's coming for you, and you're just kind of holding out for it. And you get to the point where that intuition is actually you're putting everything on the line, and then you're coming back in a major way. And that's the one thing that I think is the most inspirational about this story specifically. Even though I think I know you guys didn't really get into that, it wasn't like you know, oh god, it was just fate, and I could just feel it. I just I kind of get that vibe a little bit from it, you know. Um, that it's just one of those like I I know that I'm destined to do something else, and. Yeah. Uh, and 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 to step into to step into some pretty big shoes, you know, while while he's at it. Yeah, but uh, no, I mean, and then the other interesting thing too that I thought was, uh, I mean, I'm looking forward to another tour, maybe hitting some B and C markets. Uh, it sounds like uh, to end and start the end this year and begin the next year, as well as I'm thinking maybe they are going to put out something for the Black Friday record store day, maybe because he said. Might be new music oh, yeah. out by Black Friday, and there is a Black Friday record store day, so wouldn't surprise me if maybe they do like a seven inch or a picture disc or something. That'd be cool. That's all speculation, but I'd definitely wait in line for that. Uh, it might be one of the few things that uh, would be new that I would actually give a shit about, since seemingly now all we're getting is repressings of things that are thirty years old again for record store the, day. Yeah, that we've all had on CD for years, and all you're getting is the CD version of that, except it's on a record. It's one of those like. Anytime I buy something, I'm like, what is the what is the unique factor of this? And what's the point of me having it versus just streaming it? You know? <laughs> Speaking of the unique factor, let's uh, wrap up this episode and get to uh, our socials. If you would like to follow our partners at Mosh Pit Nation, you can find them at MoshPitNation.com. Facebook at Mosh Pit Nation West, capital M-I. Twitter and Instagram are simply Mosh Pit Nation. You can follow our show sponsor, The Bean Bastard, at TheBeanBastard.com. Follow them on Instagram and Facebook at The Bean Bastard. Uh, they just recently started finishing up their coffee carts. Looks really cool. So hopefully when I go to Buffalo in a few months, uh, we'll be able to purchase some coffee from the source and send Dan some I know, I know. And Dan, where can people find you? You can find me at 
www.discussmetal.com or you can find me on Twitter at DiscussMetalDan or you can send me an email at DiscussMetalDan at gmail.com. Dan, do you listen to podcasts? I listen to all the podcasts, John. And what is something that all the podcasts tell you to do? They tell you to rate, review, and subscribe. And why do they tell you to do that? They tell they tell me to do that because they want to be recommended to people that I know. People that listen to podcasts like the podcast that I listen to. But the problem is is that we live in a huge world. A world that doesn't really um oh what's the word? care necessarily about being advertised to, which is why we've gone more the realm of recommendations. They figure if you're already listening to podcasts, you want to hear other podcasts similar to the ones that you listen to. I and do. how do they tell whether you're satisfied or not with those podcasts? How? It's based on whether they're reviewed. It 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 really depends on that star rating. It depends on the amount of people that are subscribed to that podcast. That's how podcasts become notable is from people like you just hitting that subscribe button or hitting that review. You don't have to leave us a long review explaining everything you love and hate about the podcast. I mean, do that if you'd like to, but you don't have to. You can just click five stars, and that actually helps us. That helps us out greatly. And there's also other ways you can help out with podcasts. Like Patreon, which, as I alluded to in the intro, we put up our first Patreon episode uh, about a week ago now. Uh, I know pretty much no one has listened to it because I can see these things. Uh, but you know what? We have a Patreon, and I've had it for a while. I just haven't really been plugging it. And I know that the overall, the overall thing with Patreon is that uh, you know you got to offer sweet perks, and uh, it's still a work in progress. Like I said, uh, I got a ETA of uh, the new logo being designed, and that'll be just about a uh, two and a half weeks at this point. Uh, and then that'll be going on some shirts, and uh, yeah, basically we're just trying to raise. It's really simple. We're looking to just raise twenty dollars a month just to offset the hosting costs of uh, putting up the podcast uh, and all that kind of stuff. So for a dollar, you get a shout out. At two dollars now, we're going to be doing two Patreon exclusive episodes. Uh, we're going to be recording a new one here pretty soon uh, to go up probably next week, and. Uh, yeah, the first one, like I said, uh, we went through and made our own top ten list, Dan and I, uh, of the 2000s active radio rock singles. I don't think they're necessarily songs that you might think of. I swear there's no Godsmack. I can't say that there's no Nickelback, but you'll have to find out yourself. And uh, we're just looking to have fun with this and to start getting some engagement from you guys uh, across our socials. So if you'd like to, again, go to the Patreon, throw us some monetary support. Uh, you can find us at patreon.com slash Johnson's Title Podcast. Uh, and you can keep up with the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Johnson's Title Podcast. Tweet at us at Johnson's Title Pod and email us at Johnson's Title Pod at gmail.com. There is a website johnsuntitledpod.com uh, but basically just any of those ways that you want to keep up with the podcast we're posting new stuff trying to post uh, different content and so forth, live videos and, and, and all that fun stuff uh, maybe if Dan gets on Instagram we can start uh, doing live feeds or photos of the shows we go to and all that kind of fun stuff but uh, yeah I'm going to go ahead and tease uh, a little bit of what we got coming up uh, as of today that I am recording this I am talking to Mike Mirror from Suicidal Tendencies on Wednesday. I'm going to try to. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll uh, see. It's going to be a very brief chat. Uh, I'm getting about 15, 20 minutes with him, but that's better than no minutes with him. And uh, from there, later that evening, I will be talking to Mike, the guitar player from Phil Philip H. Anselmo and the Illegals. And uh, I just got sent their new record, which already a couple tracks in. Pretty fucking aggressive and all over the spectrum of all things heavy. So looking forward to everyone else hearing that. And then Thursday, talking to someone from King Parrot. So we're going in really aggressive direction in the next uh, couple episodes. Oh, nice. And on that note, we're going to end this episode as we always do with a song. And as you heard Matt say, he wanted me to play it out to Focus Shall Not Fail. From This Darkened Heart by All That Remains, uh, a song that he was the most proud of when he was in the band. And speaking of the band, if you would like to keep up with them, you can find them on Facebook at CKY Music, Instagram at CKY Music, Twitter at CKY Music, and you can keep up with Matt on the only form of social media he's got at Matt Dice, D-E-I-S. 
And with that, we are going to end this episode, and we will talk to you guys next time.